Hello, this is TGC Requiem. I'm here with a black-green Infect deck tech. Um, this is right now the number one uh, deck in my queue for preparing for Grand Prix Detroit. Um, part of this is because of Eldrazi. I do not think the deck has a favorable matchup against Eldrazi. I don't know that a bunch of decks do have a favorable matchup against Eldrazi, but I think this deck is close enough that you can get some wins against Eldrazi, um, and I feel like it's really well positioned uh, against the rest of the field. So, um, or decently positioned against the rest of the field, where I feel like the deck is just really solid, basically. Um, for the current meta. Basically this is in fact, um, like blue-green in fact, the difference obviously being black from the blue. Now the big difference is the blue-green in fact is probably about a half turn, may maybe three quarters of a turn at most faster, but half turn is probably about right. Um, about a half turn faster than black-green in fact, but black-green in fact is more resilient. Um, both decks share a lot of the same things, uh, very specifically Glistener Elf, 1-1 um, one, one Infect Creature. This is your this is your quickest way to, to bust out a, like a turn 2 win. Turn 2 wins are not very common. Turn 3 wins are fairly common if your opponent doesn't do anything to you. Uh, and Glistener Elf is your kind of your best way to have that happen. Now, turn two, I think, in the black-green is fairly rare because you kind of need a mutagenic growth. There's a couple scenarios, but um, we're not running any mutagenic growth in the main, so it's pretty difficult without um, without Gataxian probes filling the graveyard to hit a become event. So really, the only way we can do it in black-green is with a mutagenic growth, and that's not happening main deck at least. So. Um, but Glistener Elf's your, your one drop, one one infect creature. We're also sharing Noble Hierarch. In this deck it doesn't tap for black unfortunately, where in blue green it taps for blue and green. Um, but the big thing that we play this for, it is mana ramp and it's exalted trigger, right? Exalted helps us get extra damage without having pump spells, very important. Um, the other shared card um, from a creature standpoint, is the land Ink Moth Nexus, which can turn into a 1 1 flying and infect a creature until end of turn. Um, it's resilient because it can't be handled with sorcery speed removal, save land destruction, and most removal spells, uh, not most, a lot of removal spells can't target lands anyway, or some removal spells. So, um, that's kind of the, the core creatures that come over from the blue-green version. Um, we also share Might of Old Crosa, which gives your creature plus four, plus four, um, if it's played in your main phase. So, you know, it's less valuable as a combat trick than, say, Groundswell, but Groundswell requires more in terms of having a land enter that turn. So um, sometimes, you know, you're only run 21 land, so land can be a little light. Groundswell is sometimes a little harder to hit. Groundswell is good in kind of a different sort of meta, but right now everything's so blistering fast that just uh, the easiest way to make sure you're getting plus four, plus four is the most important, and that's Might of Old Crosa. Um, <clears throat> Vines of Vastwood also shared across the decks. The big thing here is this is a one mana protection spell. So uh, the blue-green version also runs Apostles Blessings typically, usually at least one or two, and sometimes they run some counter magic. Um, and so the counter magic can help protect creatures. Vines is really our only protection spell in that regard, um, or in that style in terms of being able to target creature can't be this target of spells or abilities your opponent's control this turn so your opponent tries to lightning bolt your glistener elf and you can vines of vast wood to make your opponent's spell not be able to target it um, plus it has a kicker so you can pay an extra green to give your creature plus four plus four um, so again it's a pump spell kind of like might of old crosa in that regard costs a little more but primarily you're using it in the early game to protect and then um, mid-game to, to pump and protect. So Vines is good. The other thing that Vines does, and, and the example I'm going to use is, um, you know, yeah, I was going to say Splinter Twin, right? So Splinter Twin just got banned, but 
you would splinter twin a deceiver exarch and or your opponent would and in response you could target their deceiver exarch and then target creature can't be the target of spells or abilities your opponents control this turn the way this is worded it's 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 almost like trying to say your creature has hexproof but it doesn't it's worded in a way that allows you to use it as disruption to your opponent's game plan as well so if your opponent's trying to pump or enchant or do something to their own creature you can use it to um, to basically blow that up so the example i guess the best example i could think of right now is your opponent tries to um, arcbound ravenger they sack a bunch of stuff and then they try to transfer all those counters over to another creature um, when they sacrifice the Arcbound Ravenger, and you can target that creature and using Finds of Asswood stop all those counters from transferring over. So a very versatile spell, just a really, really powerful spell in general. So um, now in terms of protection, the um, the deck again is only running the vines, but while we don't run Gitaxian Probe, which you know, helps us see what your opponent has and feed the graveyard for comments. We run Inquisition, which is kind of like our pseudo Cataxian probe, pseudo um, spell pierce, pseudo um, apostles blessing. In the regard that the goal is, we're going to look at their hand, and on top of that, we're going to take away the car, the card that best interrupts what we're trying to do. Right, so. Inquisition kind of covers all of those bases to some regard. Um, each of those other cards are probably a little better at what they do, but Inquisition's kind of, in this regard, like a charm, right? It, it kind of does a little bit of all those things, and therefore um, it's it's just really solid. And obviously we know it's a great card in Modern in general, but um, that's the benefit. You're going to take away the spell that they're going to try and kill you with, and that way you don't need your... Um, you know, your counter spell or your, ideally, your Apostle's Blessings. Hopefully you can get away with just Finds of Asswood. Now, the other card that's shared across the decks is Become Immense. Um, Become Immense, target creature gets plus six, plus six until end of turn. So when you're de dealing infect damage, which means you only need to do 10 infect to your opponent versus the normal 20 damage, this is just massive, massive, because it's always being put on a creature that's already, like, at least a 1-1. One, one. Um, and so you fill the graveyard up pretty fast with fetches and inquisitions and you know your first creature might get killed allowing you to attack with ink moth and become immense the ink moth so um just a massive massive spell you're often casting for you know essentially one mana the only other card that is shared other than say fetches and shocks or basics or whatever is Pendlehaven. And Pendlehaven is a extremely important land. It's often run in doubles, but it's a little more difficult to run in doubles than the black green uh, for Frex and Crusader, which we'll talk about in a minute. But the cool thing here is it's you know so it's a legendary land. It comes in upright, allowing you to use mana right away. But it also has a second option where you can give target 1-1 one, one creature plus 1 plus 2 until end of turn. Um, and so this just again helps increase damage. If you have a Noble Hierarch on the battlefield it's important to make sure you do this before the Exalted trigger otherwise you can't do it. Also you cannot use it on Phyrexian Crusader on account of its 2-2 two, two, um, power and toughness. So Pendlehaven again like Noble Hierarch's Exalted trigger it's just a way to add extra damage without pump spells. So. Now the differences between this and the, the black green, as we've already touched on Inquisition and kind of how that covers or compares to the, bl the blue green, Plague Stinger is kind of your pseudo replacement for um, Blighted Agent. Now Blighted Agent is a 1-1 one, one infect creature. It does not have flying, but it has unblockable. Uh, unblockable is pretty good when your goal is just to do as much damage in one swing as possible. Uh, and you don't have to do all that much because, again, you're just doing 10 in fact, right? So um, Plague Stinger is not as good in a vacuum as Blighted Agent. That being said, it still is evasive, and it can beat a lot of decks in modern just on the fact that they don't have any flying creatures and therefore um, it's kind of a pseudo unblockable. Now there's also a lot of decks like Affinity and um, 
you know, anything with lingering souls that does have flyers. And so in this case, Plague Stinger is typically, I'm not going to say always, typically better than, uh, sorry, typically worse than Blighted Agent. However, Plague Stinger also has the benefit of being able to block those flying creatures. Uh, specifically, this is relevant against Affinity, as Affinity is going to throw a lot of flyers at you, and they're going to try and get their lethal damage through um, in their alpha strikes when they go that route with flyers, almost always. Um, maybe with Edge Champions sometimes, um, but Edge Champions kind of on the down slope right now. So, um, not that it's a bad card, it's just that the um, the blue Master of Ethereum artifact's a little better for them right now. So anyway, uh, Plague Stinger, it gives you your evasiveness, you can still get some, some strikes through where they don't have a blocker, and likewise it actually offers some value in, in blocking and matchups where that might be relevant. Um, <clears throat> now similar, this is kind of another thing, Abrupt Decay. Uh, Abrupt Decay offers some value main deck that your opponent, or that the blue-green rather, uh, would kind of use, like uh, blue-green has um, Apostle's Blessing and sometimes they'll run the newer card slip through space to basically try and get through unblocked with creatures that could otherwise be blocked, such as Glisten or Elf, um, you know, or Ink Moth Nexus against Affinity or something like that. So instead of Instead of unblockable, what we have is Abrupt Decay, and Abrupt Decay kind of clears blockers out of the way. You know, most of the creatures are small enough that Abrupt Decay can hit by the time we're trying to go for a lethal. Not always, but a lot of times. And um, it's also super relevant against cards like uh, Blood Moon. A lot of people are talking about because of Eldrazi playing uh, and Snaring Bridge and... Um, What's the other one? I keep wanting to say worship, but worship's too big. It's uh, ghostly prison, and so these different um, these different prison lock type effects that don't let your creatures attack through. And so abrupt decay is really huge because it can just destroy any of those permanents, and again can't be countered. So abrupt decay is kind of like your clear the way. It also you know can blow up. Tarmogoyce that are putting a clock on you while you don't have a creature in hand to, or on the battlefield, and so Abrupt Decay just offers some value. Um, and so it's a big part of why I'm choosing black-green over the blue-green, um, that and the Inquisition. These these kind of these, these uh, eight spells here, Inquisitions and Abrupt Decays, again, in a vacuum, when you're trying to be as fast as possible, they're not necessarily the best spells um, to get that through. However, again, kind of like I, I use the example of charms, they're so powerful against so many things, or they're powerful enough against so many things, that they just offer a lot more resiliency than the blue-green, where maybe you need one of those specific cards um, to get you all the way there, but the other one might not get you there at all, right? And so, I feel like Abrupt Decay and Inquisition are kind of like, well, we may not get you all the way there, but we're always going to get you part of the way there. And and so again, it just kind of allows you to play a slightly longer game if you need to in that regard. So anyway, um, again, I'm not saying these aren't powerful cards. These are very powerful cards. It's just when you compare them to what Blue Green is trying to do to be as fast as possible. Um, lastly, not lastly, there's one other card we're going to talk about, but we're going to tie it with Phyrexian Crusader. Um, Phyrexian Crusader is kind of the biggest reason you're coming into Black Green. So there's other really good reasons, as we've already talked about, but Phyrexian Crusader is just bananas. Now, he's slower, certainly at three mana. You can drop him turn two off of Noble Hierarch if you, if you get the mana right. Um, the big thing here is... Well, two big things. First thing we're going to talk about is First Strike. So, First Strike with Infect is pretty awesome because when you do damage to your opponent, the uh, your opponent's creatures rather, they take minus one, minus one counters. So, a great example of this is you attack into a 3-4 Tarmogoyth and he blocks with a 3-4 Tarmogoyth. You do two 
damage to him, first strike. So now the Tarmogoyf gets two minus one minus one counters and all of a sudden is a one two, and it only does one damage back to you during normal combat damage, not killing you, but you have effectively shrunken his Tarmogoyf, um, which is pretty awesome. Now, when you pair that with something like Rancor, with first strike, you can kill a lot of creatures before they can even strike back at you. Um, Rancor, of course, enchant creature, enchanted creature gets plus 2-0 and has trample. When Rancor is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, return Rancor to its owner's hand. So it is the weakest spell, pump spell, in terms of uh, Might of Walcrosa ideally giving you four, Vines ideally giving you four. This only gives you two, and again, it has to be played at sorcery speed. But the benefit here is you put it on your Glistener Elf turn two, you attack in, maybe get two infect in, but your Glistener Elf dies, the Rancor goes to the graveyard, comes back to your hand, and you have it to cast on the next creature. Well, the benefit again with putting it on a Phyrexian Crusader, Phyrexian Crusader has first strike, and so you get four infect in. You're gonna, there's very few creatures that are gonna be able to get the two damage back on your Phyrexian Crusader. Um, before he kills them. So that's that's a pretty powerful play if you can get that going on. The other reason we're running Phyrexian Crusader, beyond the fact that it has an extra point of toughness, is the fact that it has protection from red and white, which is pretty crazy powerful outside of the Eldrazi matchup. Um, protection from red and white. So the two most commonly played spells in modern are Lightning Bolt, which is in like 35% of the decks, and Path to Exile, which is in like 27% of the decks, according to MTG Goldfish. Two most commonly played spells, removal spells, cannot remove Phyrexian Crusader. It also, if you think about protection, how protection works, DET is the, the acronym to help you remember, D-E-B-T, uh, damage, protection from damage, enchantments, blockers, and targeting. So um, a spell like Pyroclasm or Anger of the Gods, even though it doesn't target Phyrexian Crusader, because those particular red removal spells typically don't destroy, they do a certain amount of damage, it has protection from those. Um, it has protection from terminate. It has protection from these other spells that are all removal spells that are among the top 25 most commonly played spells in modern. It has protection from lightning helix, uh, galvanic blast, L is it lava spike? Not lava spike, um, uh, the red one, Rift Bolt. Rift Bolt's what I'm thinking of. And Searing Blaze. So, pretty much most of the removal in the format. Uh, removal in the format that it doesn't have protection from. Dismember. Um, I'm just skimming through the list real quick. Abrupt Decay and Liliana the Veil, if you want to call Sacrifice. Um, but point being is, most of the, the popular removal can't hit Phyrexian Crusader. Some can. In black matchups, Phyrexian Crusader is probably not as good. Um, still, it doesn't mean he's bad, because the games typically go a little longer with all the removal. Um, but, but again, that's the point. A lot of decks can't do it. Now, on top of that, as we noted, with debt, D-E-B-T, protection from blockers. So in a red matchup where, so say you're playing like uh, burn and, and they realize they have to hold the blocker back so that, that way you can't get lethal through this turn, well they can't block a Phyrexian Crusader and they can't kill it. So if you can just go for it and kill them before they can do lethal to your face, you know, again, just phenomenal. So. One of the biggest draws to um, black green effect over blue black effect is Phyrexian Crusader. The other thing to note is that Phyrexian Crusader with um, Plague Stinger, Glistener Elf, and Ink Moth gives you four more um, creatures, infect creatures, than blue green effect does. Um, certainly, blue green effect can come up with other infect creatures, but the point is, is they're these are the most uh, popular infect creatures. 
for these colors and they're more powerful than any of the colorless ones or other ones that blue green can play and so it's really not worth blue green playing the other ones so again you can see the makeup of this build is a little different um, and you can kind of maybe see how it's a little more resilient while maybe not quite as explosive primarily due to the um, fewer pump spells overall so that's the main deck um, sideboard, we'll just skim through real quick. Thoughtseize is good for combo decks. It's also probably a little bit better against Eldrazi decks. You know, pay two life to rip a Reality Smasher out of your opponent's hand, and instead of two Mimics and a Reality Smasher attacking for 15, you know, maybe they play a three three damage or three power creature like a Mattery Shaper, and only attack for six that turn. So, Thoughtseize can be good in that matchup. Vampiric Link can be good against burn. Um, also good against big creatures like Reality Smasher where you can delay their damage some. Doomblade, uh, when you need removal for a creature that is larger than 3 CMC, uh, also can only target non-black creatures, but the big thing here is again, this can hit Eldrazi, or it could hit like Primeval Titan in a deck that might play that. Mutagenic Growth, um, I'd like to find room for a second one in here, I just haven't been able to do this yet, but Mutagenic Growth is a free-to-cast spell when you need to just try and be as fast as possible. So against Eldrazi, I would probably bring this in. Uh, also, I could bring it in against a deck that might run Pyroclasm effects to try and make my Glistener Elf, my Plague Stinger, or Noble Hierarch live through a Pyroclasm. Crusader can do that on its own, but the other cards can't. Uh, it also helps speed up the clock for Become Immense. It's part of why I want to find room for a second. Could probably easily replace Rancor in the matchups where it's needed, or maybe uh, Abrupt Decays. Nature's Claim, the same reason Nature's Claim is always good. Um, we don't care about their life total, and so giving your opponent four life doesn't really matter. Destroy target artifact or enchantment at instant speed for one green. Um, Affinity, the... Lantern control decks. Uh, I mean, just a ton of a ton of stuff. And there's just enchantments and and uh, this is your way to beat worship, for example. Um, just lots of lots of value for these. In the mirror, they can kill your ink moth nex or your opponent's ink moth nexuses. So anyway, um, pulse of Marasa. Pulse of Marasa is this is one of those cards where it's not the best option. Um, I mean, there's ways to get more life for cheaper, um, and there's also cheaper ways to return a target creature or land from your graveyard to your hand, um, but this is good against, like, burn and zoo, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and you gain, as you gain the life, but you also get to return a card that may have been killed already, a creature card, or, you know, maybe you're a land short and you can go get a fetch from your graveyard to get you to the, the mana you need to cast something the following turn or whatever. Um, but the other thing is it's really good against decks that are attrition-y because they're going to kill a lot of your creatures and then you can end step, you know, put a creature back in hand once they've run out of removal. So I, I really like Pulse because it's viable in a lot of matchups, maybe not the best, um, best way to gain life or the best way to get a creature. Um, or land into your hand, but but still, good in a lot of matchups. Viridian Corruptor, um, another infect creature, 2-2, two, two, and when it enters the battlefield, destroy target artifact. So again, good for, you know, Chalice of the Voids, good for, uh, which we are also have abrupt decays for, um, good for affinity as well. And so, um, now we don't need as much. Uh, blue Green's running like two to four of these right now because Affinity is so popular and we don't need it because we're already running Abrupt Decays, we're also running Nature's Claims, and we're running Creeping Corrosion. Um, we only really need one, so that's why we're only running one. And Creeping Corrosion for Affinity, it's also really good against Lantern Control. Um, also, I, I don't know if Blue Black Tezzeret seeing a lot of play. I've heard some rumors about it being good against Affinity or against um, Eldrazi. Uh, Creeping Crow would be good there as well. Nihil Spellbomb. Um, this is a way to handle graveyard decks, and, and that might be like a Grixis control deck, though those don't seem so popular right now. But um, really good against like Living End or a deck such as. 
uh, Chris Schulbrand. The big thing here is you can pay one to get it on the graveyard, and you can sacrifice it for free, right? You don't have to pay a mana to sacrifice it, and it exiles all cards from target player's graveyard. So there's a couple of benefits here. One, um, it only costs one up front. You can sacrifice it whenever you want to exile all cards from target player's graveyard. So typically you're going to want to exile cards from your opponent's graveyard, leaving your graveyard stocked for a become immense. And ideally, because you're playing a fast enough game, you don't really need to do this more than once. Um, some people will play the Ley Line of the Void, and that is a feasible option. However, if you draw, if you don't have it in your open hand and draw it, it's going to be really bad. Um, the Heal Spell Bomb, ideally you only need to use one time, and and that's enough for you to get the infect damage in that you want to get in. And this still has upside in the fact that when it's put in the graveyard from Battlefield, you can pay black to draw a card similar to Relic of Progenitus, um, where Relic of Progenitus costs one up front and costs one to sack it for the entire graveyard. So I think Nihil's Spell Bomb is kind of clearly the best choice for this, um, this style of deck. And it's not really something that can be played in the blue-green version because of the black requirement, but it's definitely, in my opinion, the best one for this version. Um, and then finally Spellskite. Spellskite is good against a lot of different matchups. You know, you can bring it in the mirror, you can bring it in against, you know, Zoo to just be a blocker. You can bring it in against um, Bogles. Um, and again, you can bring it in against just heavy removal decks to try and, you know, keep one of your creatures alive long enough to, to get lethal in. So, uh, oh, there's one last thing. Sorry, so we're running 21 lands. We are not running Dryad Arbor. Uh, Dryad Arbor is commonly run in... And actually, let me just pull Dryad Arbor up so you can see it real quick for those of you who don't know. Dryad Arbor is a land creature, Forest Dryad 1-1. One, one. So... When you play Infect, sometimes people know that their life totals don't matter, and so they get a little loose. They'll fetch for shock, fetch for shock, fetch for shock. Um, you know, do a bunch of things to, to hurt themselves. And they may kill all your creatures, and all of a sudden they're completely tapped out on their end step. Um, you have a bunch of pump spells in hand and no way to kill them. With Infect, because all your Infect creatures are dead, but you have one fetch that has not been cracked. And you can fetch for a Dryad Arbor on end step, and then attack in, you know, pumping it with Might of Old Krosa, uh, maybe Might of Old Krosa again, and it become immense to do, you know, I don't know what's that, 8, 14, 15 damage or something like that. Regular damage. Now you can still get that damage win in with a Noble Hierarch, but point being is this can kind of come out of nowhere. Um, I will probably try to put Dryad Arbor in at some point. The problem with it here is Phyrexian Crusaders double black makes it really difficult, and Dryad Arbor um, cannot be tapped the turn it comes in for mana because it is summoning sick because it's a creature, which is kind of funny. But it is a forest that can be fetched by green, and, and the other reason that that's kind of an issue is. The blue-green, in fact, runs something like um, eight or nine green fetches. This deck runs eight black fetches and six green fetches. And that's because Phyrexian Crusader is really important, and the black in general is really important, more so than blue. And so there is going to be a point where I may consider trying to find room for the Dryad Arbor just to kind of liven that up. But so far, we're going to test, for now, we're going to test it out and see if it's, um, if it's able to be, if we're able to handle things with just the infect damage itself. So... Anyway, I think that's it for now. Hopefully you enjoy the, enjoyed the deck tech. Um, I think it's a pretty good deck. I plan to play it quite a bit here over the next few days, or next couple weeks. And so hopefully we'll get, to, we'll get to learn a little bit more about the deck as we play it. I've only played it maybe 10 times or so. I played Blue Green Infect about 
20 matches. Uh, so still relatively new to the archetype in general. However, um, this kind of feels like it fits more into my wheelhouse of how I like to play and still could be fast enough. And again, big, big thing here is it, it could be fast enough. It's a little slower than Eldrazi, but it could be fast enough to beat it in some matches, right? So you're gonna lose some matches. I would assume we probably lose 40%. You know, or we lose 60%, maybe we win 40% against Eldrazi. However, if the rest of the field's trying to fight Eldrazi as well, you know, I feel like this deck is good against the rest of the fields, um, strongly because of Phyrexian Crusader and just the Infect race in general. So um, that's the deck tech. Hopefully you enjoy.